Hello everyone, Cameron O'Hara here. Thank you very much for tuning in to this interview with Michael Benier for the Season 2 episode of Reboot, Bad Bob. You all had some great questions, and I wanted to say off the bat thank you to Kindred Arcane, Alconium, Alana Stark, Rob, Ninjas with iPods, Rachel, Arcade, Nicole, David, Luke, Mark, and Brosiak. Your questions shaped this interview. Michael was really awesome and took a look at all of them ahead of time to prepare for the interview. So, please take your seats and fasten your safety belts. It's going to be a fun ride. Thank you very much for joining me. We have the great uh, Michael Beignet here with us today. You are a, uh, a voice actor, an actor, and a raconteur, as I understand it. <laughs> That's right, raconteur, yes. Yes. Which is very cool. Uh, you've done a lot of stuff. You've done TV, you've done uh, movies, you've done video games. Tell me, sir, what is it that you have not done? I've not run Broadway yet. Broadway. That's the next step then. I was in I New York see. doing a show recently and I went to f a few Broadway shows and I was like, this is what I would like to do. But that's a big, you know, a big learning curve to get to there, you know, a big jump. Never say never though, you know. Never say never. I'd go see you. I'd go Thank see you. What, what kind of Maybe thing we'll do, do you want to we'll, do? We'll, do? we'll do reboot the musical. How's that? Ah, you know what? That would be perfect. You have, you already have the music. You have the right. whole thing set up. Right. But actually, I'm not a great singer, so it would have to be kind of like a drawing room uh, comedy a reboot. You know, maybe Bob <laughs> and uh, Dot and Enzo as older characters, you know, kind of a whodunit, maybe. What I wanted to say about Bad Baba is just a little background. I mean, I originally started recording a reboot in Vancouver, I would say, in 93. I was about 23. And... Um, it took so long to get the show going because it was a new technology that it didn't air for over a year. I mean, till the September of, of 94, right? So in that time, right. I came to L.A. and I got another job, which was a Johnny Quest, where I played Haji on the new Johnny Quest. So, so I you were doing both had, of those at the same time? I was doing three or four shows at that time. I was doing... Uh, I was still doing a show called Exo Squad. I was doing a show called The Hurricanes. And I was doing um, Reboot and then Johnny Quest, as well as other, you know, ge you know, guest star parts on different things. So, you know, I was a young actor, and my, my intention was to go to Los Angeles to kind of make it more on camera. But I was getting a lot of voiceover that was just kind of coming to me because I get, got being known for that. So when I went to L.A. and I got Definitely. my visa and to be able to work in the States, I wanted to capitalize on that. And um, I continued to fly back to Vancouver to record with everybody in the room for Reboot. And um, I'm sure you know, Tony J, who played the villain, actually was based in Los Angeles. And right. as it happens, we had the same agent for voiceover in Los Angeles. And I met him in the waiting room one time. And uh, he's like, oh, yo, yo, Bob. And I was like, yes. So then after a while, they <laughs> trusted me. Yes, we meet at last. After a while, they trusted me to do it by myself. So they put me, I would say in the second season, I did several episodes uh, in L.A. by myself right after Tony had done his session. And he, I watched him record that, remember that episode, uh, Bad Bob, and he would do every line um, sitting. He was seated in front of, with, in front of his script, smoking. And he would do each line three times. So I remember specifically Bad Bob. We did it at a studio on Melrose Avenue in L.A. called Buzzies. And the director of that session, they brought in the executive producer, a guy named Chris Bruff, who kind of heralded and shepherded Reboot from the beginning. And he directed me, and he had this kind of New York kind of accent. And he was, like, giving me direction. Yell more, more yelling, you know. You're, you're, you're <laughs> hanging off the side of a truck. So I had a script, and I kind of quickly went through it. I think I recorded everything in about 30 minutes. Usually wow. a session is about four hours. So that one, I, my, my memory of recording that episode was me yelling for 30 minutes, basically, <laughs> and losing my voice kind of at the end. I kind of sound like this because last night uh, the Raptors won the game, and I was talking to a lot of people in a bar here in L.A. So I don't have a lot to say about the recording because I was by myself for that, for that one. And it's interesting how things... How, how viewers, you know, get a, a different sense of it as opposed to the voice actor, because unless there's a lot of dialogue or interplay with somebody, it's just going to be like, I went into a studio and I, I recorded the lines. Someone asked improvisation. There was one episode where 
there was it was a, it was an overwritten episode, and it's my favorite episode. I've been asked many times, which is called Wizards and Warriors. And um, I believe there was more improvisation in that one. And I remember specifically there were certain things. Uh, it was all kind of pop culture references, and, and he had a little bit as as a Mike the TV where he did a kind of a WC Fields. Get away from me, boy! You're bothering <laughs> yes. me. I think I suggested that in the room. I said something like right. that, you know. So everything was so well written by by the writers. And uh, when you when you do animation, it's not like they're like, let's do something for fun and see, you know, see what happens. I mean, yes, no, you're, no. you're not filming it, right? So you're, you know, so they take out anything they don't like or anything, you know. I think the, the the improvisational aspect that made it into the show were probably funny interpretations of the lines. It's not as it was written. You know, I've read since the show has been off, you know, that, that they originally intended Bob to be kind of a um, a Michael Bean type character, if you know Michael Bean from Aliens. Yes. And yes, that yes, uh, yes. when I kind of was cast, they they started listening to my interpretation of the character and they started writing to my, uh, what I like to call, fallible hero. I mean, if you listen back, it was kind of, I was inspired by kind of um, Michael J. Fox at the time, kind of like his voice would crack when when things would get out of control. He was a guy trying yes. to be a hero, but wasn't really a hero. Spider Man comes to you know a young Spider Man, so definitely you know that was uh, I think that was the the entry point for me when I when I started playing Bob was it was kind of a guy who was thrust into this responsibility, whereas a, a lot of other heroes would be I'm doing this and you know I'm I'm very capable. And I right. think that that's where they said that he was trying to be cool, but it sounded cheesy, which was kind of the the funny part about it, you know, which is, you know, stay frosty, which, I mean, if it was Clint Eastwood, <laughs> it would be very cool, but stay frosty, you know what I mean? But with <laughs> me, I had this kind of cheery young guy voice, and it just sounded like a, a you know, a cheesy guy, and it was kind of funny. So um, maybe that aspect of it was improvised. Speaking of this person, the character who's, pushed into a situation that he didn't anticipate that kind of right. that's something that we see in the mad max films too which is you know of right. course what this episode is parroting have you yes. seen of course you've seen the mad max films right i have i saw them when they came out originally um and i saw the, the latest one which was incredible a couple of years ago incredible was, yeah, yeah i mean visually incredible but uh you know once again story-wise it's basically two chases you know so I mean, yes. it's not like a lot of plot points. <laughs> so you know, it's just basically action for an hour and a half. You know, which is basically uh, the episode of of Bad Bob. So you know, as far as acting choices going, it's not like what's my motivation. Your motivation is to yell at the top of your lungs. <laughs> uh, you know, the lines right. that people can hear over the pounding rock music score. You have some good lines in that uh, episode, though. I understand what you're saying, but like that. Uh... Let's get busy, kind of stuff. Sure, like, sure. I that mean, was guess... a result of my voice being thrashed. At that point. <laughs> yes, it was you know, a short go, recording, I, I suppose, then, but really, it intense. was. It was. It was. Yeah, it was. And I, I go back, you know, to prepare for this. I went and I, I kind of Googled the, the show, and I, I was looking at the, you know, the Wikipedia entries about it, and how certain, you know, catchphrases, you know, people, people, you know, glom onto, and they, and they listen to, it. and I'm like, wow, it's, it's, it's amazing how. I'm I'm looking at this show 20 years after the fact, right? I mean, we're we're looking at the show 20 years or 25 years after the fact. That was 96. I recorded that. that. I remember it was about 96 that one. So it's funny how, in, in in hindsight, things are remembered, right? At the time, it was it was another show that I was doing, and I was trying to get other things. And then it's really nice to see how it's remembered, and it's so you know precious to people. Just the other day, I, I was going through boxes in Vancouver, and I found old scripts. I have the scripts from all the shows, and, and really? I found the facts that I, I posted on the Reboot to fan page on, on, on Facebook. Yes. which of Thank which you was that, the, by the way. Of course, yeah. So it was two pages only, and that's really the only copy of that ex that exists because it was faxed last minute. And if you look at the date, that was September 2nd, and I believe the show aired a week later. So that they added that very last minute. So there was never, I mean, I was faxed that and I showed up at the studio and Chris Bruff again said, um, you know, this is going to be the opening of the show. And, uh, and uh, I remember it was, you know, it was early in the morning and um, I did it several different ways. And then, you know, less than a week later it aired. And then that little memento means something to people. And I, when I do these conventions and I go and 
I ask the audience if they know the opening, you know, four or 500 people en masse, unrehearsed, recite it together like the Lord's Prayer. So, I mean, it's, yeah. it's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible to me. And I, and I was in a, in a predicament a few years back where I couldn't attend the, one of the conventions. So I, I Skyped in and uh, they asked me if I knew the opening and I didn't know the opening. And they were shocked. But you've got to remember that it is me recording this, you know, in a session, you know, at, at 23, one time, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't watch the show three times a day. I was, you know, in my twenties trying to make it in Los Angeles. I wasn't, you know, and in Canada, it aired three times a day in the U S it aired Saturday mornings on, on, um, on ABC. So it was a, it was a bit different for me. So, um, you know, I liken it to years ago when I was a kid, there was a, on ABC, there was a thing called, uh, schoolhouse rocks. They, were, they did a Schoolhouse Rocks live performance at the Troubadour in L.A. And that was around the same time, 96, 97. Oh, no kidding. And I went to it with some friends. And Jack Sheldon, who was the voice of Conjunction Junction, amongst other things, he was there to sing these songs. And everybody knew every word. He goes, I'm sorry, I haven't seen this song since I recorded it in 19, <laughs> uh, you know, 1973. You know, so they had to bring him out the sheet music for him to, to read the lyrics. So for, for him, it was just a job that he did in, you know, he's a famous jazz musician. It was a job he did in 1973, whereas this whole room and this whole country of young people knew the Conjunction Junction song. An interesting fact, I found the script for Bob and Dot to sing Conjunction Junction for the ABC uh, Saturday morning um, up front, oh, which oh. I don't know if it exists anymore, but we did it because they were bringing back Schoolhouse Rocks and Reboot was premiering. So they wanted us to host this thing digitally. So I have the script of Conjunction Junction. I remember the producer in Los Angeles asking me over the phone, are you familiar with this? I said, I don't even need the lyrics for this one. So, so I, knew, <laughs> I knew, you know, the Conjunction Junction words, whereas a kid today might know, or an adult today who was a kid then might know, the reboot opening. Well, we'd like to see that script if it's possible at all. That would be very yeah, interesting. Yeah, I'll have to get everything out of storage. I had to every, move everything around, but... Uh, I, uh, I took a picture of that, in a, you know, in a moment, a whim to share with everybody. And, uh, and I did. Sure. So it was, and it's been very you, yeah. appreciated and uh, commented on. And by the way, if anybody's listening, they will be. Uh, the notes were not my notes. Oh, that was the be. notes from the producers. I, I didn't write anything on the script, but the notes, which is the direction. Uh, okay, of that, we that were wondering there. about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. The that's not my handwriting. And, you know, contemplative. No, that's, not, that's not my handwriting. Well, speaking about that monologue at the beginning, and I yes. think... This is something I've heard you say on the DVD commentary when you did the recording for that. Yeah. Of course, like you say, it was, you know, just a one time thing. You just kind of did yep. it and that was the end of it for you. But I remember you saying, and I don't mean to dig up the past at all here, but you're saying how that morning you were kind of uh, not with a really in a good place. With a girlfriend. Just, yes. It was I, the girlfriend. Was yeah. You yes. just said you were heartbroken. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yes. No, that's a yeah, long time ago. That's, that's rough. I'm sorry. Ago. It's okay. I know that was a while ago, but I was like 25. It's okay. I was 24, 25. Yeah, it's a long time ago. But um, sure, de sure. definitely things that you remember. And it's also when, if you watch commentaries of actors for film and TV, they remember what was happening that day as opposed to what's happening on the screen. They're like, oh, that's the day that, uh, you know, we went for Chinese food for lunch or, or whatever. Um, so yes. it's interesting. <laughs> I just, I just, a, a thing just aired this week I did, uh, in Toronto called designated survivor. I, and I was so sick that week. I didn't think I could perform. I, I, I had to go to the doctor and, and the whole thing. So, you know, I took some fishermen's friends and I got through the, the scene. And if you watch it, you'll have no idea that I was very sick, but, uh, yeah, the things that happen behind the scenes or behind the microphone, as you're saying, you know, is, uh, it, it's, it's very specific to the person and, and to that day as opposed to how the project lives on forever. Talking about this particular episode a little bit more, we've got a couple questions about this. This episode was a changing point for Bob, some people say. Uh, Lana Stark here asks, um, he, Bob was kind of growing out of his goofball shell and taking his job as a guardian a little bit more seriously. I know you talked about him, you know, being thrust into the situation. Right. But at this point, it feels like he's kind of taken things a little bit more seriously. Do you, did you feel that too? Um, yes. I remember that this, this is, it's more, you could see even the visual, you know, uh, depiction of Bob. He has the leathers and the kind of the scarring in the episode. But once again, at that time, reboot was, he, the, the character would reboot into different games and different characters, quote unquote, right? So the maturing, I, I mean, 
for me, I've talked about this in the past, the, the, the beginning, the first two seasons, especially the first season was more episodic. And to me, I approached it because there was a lot, seemed to be a lot more dialogue early on. It was like a sitcom. To me, I was doing it like a, you know, a, a sitcom. I was trying to be quick quips and all that sort of stuff. Whereas later, it became much more action oriented and more as darker. A lot of people called it darker, you know, the third season. And then, you know, so I think then they had, I think they, they obviously the creators wanted to take it in a different direction, right? So that's why, you know, they had sure. the, the, the Matrix character grow up and the Andrea character grow up and the search for Bob and all that. And I really, I had nothing to do with season three, so I, I, I don't know it. But I know that the look of it was, was different and it became a little more brooding. If, if that's, so maybe, you know, this, this episode inspired them to become more brooding. I don't know. But for me, I, appro I approached it every episode the same, which is I went in and I became, you know, Bob the Guardian. And I would, you know, kind of tune my voice to that, you know, space and, and go from there. Except for that one where I'm yelling at the top of my lungs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's get busy. That's right. That's right. Alconia masks. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, how did you approach your portrayal of Megabob in season four? Yes. You came back to it was you and uh, Ian James Corlett. Oh, and you were oh, both doing Bob. He was doing Glitch Bob. Right. You were Mega Byte in disguise as Bob. Right. right. Was there some? What was the process of portraying okay. that? That is a good. You question. were portraying Mega Bytes, portraying I... Bob. Okay. The, someone asked this, which well, I will. I will address this and it goes into the other question, which is my voice sounds different. I don't sound like Bob or, or whatever, which is Bob is my voice, but I was 23 when I started the show. So I'm sure. considerably older now. So that's the change in the voice maybe. So I had the good fortune to do the, the reboot of Johnny quest with Frank Welker. And if you know who Frank Welker is, yeah. he's, he's one of the most preeminent voice actors in the world. And we talk at great length every week about his career and life and, he was the original voice of Fred from Scooby-Doo in 1970. Yes. Okay. Unreal. He still does the voice of Fred from Scooby-Doo. And he also does the voice of Scooby-Doo now. Now, I don't know. I mean, he believes that his voice has not changed. He believes he can still do it. Now, I'm sure if we were to play them back to back, you could hear a little change in the timber. But it's pretty much him. You know, I'm trying to think if, you know, I, it's quite early for me here. But, you know, I come from the net through systems and cities and peoples to this place. I mean, it's pretty close, but I got That's 25 very good. I got 25 years on it, right? But uh, okay. how did I approach uh, the, the the version in uh, 2000, 2001? It was basically unclear to me until we got there. I don't think I got the script very early that that I was an imposter version and that was the whole thing. Um, I did not play it as though I was a guy in pretending to be Bob. Does that make sense? Which is when you sure. play a villain in a movie, you don't say, I'm a villain. You say, I'm right. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. You play it as though you're the hero. Totally. Otherwise, it becomes very arch. So, um, you know, I've played villains in TV shows and movies. And the key to doing that well, if I may say, is to play it as though you are completely justified. Do you follow what I'm saying? So I played right. it as though I was still Bob. Which makes sense when you put it out like that, you know, because he was, I mean, he's not going to go in there, Megabyte, I mean, he's not going to go in there and, you know, have it up like, oh, yes, I, I'm Bob kind of thing. Right. He's going to be as close right. to the real thing as he's is possible. But everything but what was it like to come back for the... What was it like? Yes. Um, I mean... I will, I will tell you, I've told this before, yeah. I don't know where, but I'll, I'll tell it again. Uh, at that point, I was a little disenchanted with acting as a business. And I decided to go to law school and right. I was accepted to law school and they uh, said that we're doing these, these movies. And I said, okay. And I, and I was in Vancouver and I recorded several of them, but I got the call. I remember I got the call from my agent and she said, reboot called and uh, they want you to be in it. And I, I remember laughing and I said, but they fired me. <laughs> And she goes, yes. She goes, but um, they want you in it. And then, and then somehow I found out that Ian was doing it. And I said, we're both in it. And I thought maybe that we were going to both <laughs> be both record it, and they would choose which one they like better. But I was kind of over at that moment, and I was like, okay. And then I found out that we were playing the new and the old version, and one was a fake, and all this. 
And I was like, okay. And then I basically didn't pay too close attention to it because I was kind of my eye was on going to law school in a couple of weeks. So I went to law school and then I was in Winnipeg, which was my first year of law school. And I got the call that they wanted to re-record the opening, uh, you know, the opening of the show. And uh, I said, that's great, but I'm in Winnipeg. I'm not flying back. And they go, oh, no, no, we'll record you in Winnipeg. And I remember laughing to myself how things had changed, which is originally the whole issue was that they wanted me to be in Vancouver for the records. And they, they you know, I had to bend for them. And now when I didn't care anymore, they recorded me in, I recorded it in the CBC building mm -hmm. in downtown Winnipeg before my criminal law class. Wow. And I, yeah. So it how was Canadian before your criminal uh, law yes, class. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so, um, that's what happened there. Yeah. That's what I remember about uh, season uh, four. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know what their plans were after that. Season Someone four, asked that's what, right. what, what, what happened after that. And uh, I think they wanted to do more, but there was no. some financing thing that happened with uh, YTV or whoever. So, you know, once again, yes, yeah. you know, um, I was just an actor and I had other things in my life at the time and I was concentrating on school and, uh, you know, it, uh, it wasn't on my mind. I was like, well, I guess they'll call me when they call me. And they, sure. they called me, uh, 18 years later, I guess for the, uh, the, the guardian code. <laughs> so, that, so that's what happened. And what well, was that maybe like coming back again? What was that like? Um, there was some talk that, you know, it was a whole read, you know, picking up. I thought it was going to be, you know, many episodes with Bob and got in dot and, you know, the whole gang. But it wasn't that. It was just the one episode, and it was kind of a newer show where it was updated, mm -hmm. live action, and all that. So, and once again, I haven't watched that show. I've only seen the one episode sure. that I did. And uh, here's a, here's a here's a date for you, which is the day I recorded that episode of the Guardian Code was the U.S. election when Donald Trump was elected. I, Ooh, I recorded that the day. That's an interesting the morning, parallel. The morning of the election, and we did not think he would be elected. And by that night, you know, the world changed. That's the, world the day changed, I recorded. And it hasn't yeah. been the same since. No. Yikes. Wow. Yeah. What a, so you probably went into the booth thinking like, oh yeah, whatever. Like this guy's going to get in. And then you come out of the booth and you're like, oh my gosh, it's just it the wasn't apocalypse. When I came out of the booth. It wasn't when I came out of the booth. It was the next, that, that night. But I remember, that you night. know, I'm, I was in, La, so. I'm in Los Angeles recording it and they were in Vancouver and they weren't really that concerned with it. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, right. They didn't really care about it, and of course, they care now. <laughs> they care that now. Was, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was that. That was that day. Yikes! Yeah. That's scary. That's scary. It's too bad that they only had you for that one episode, though. You know, if they had just, you know, because they brought you back, they brought um, Shirley Milner back, they brought um, Kathleen Barr. Yes. They had the three of you there. They had. Right. They have a pretty decent uh, voice actor for Megabyte. You know, nobody is ever going to be a, as good as Tony great J. Match. That's a great match. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Going back to Bad Bob a little bit. Um, yes. I don't know how much you know about this, but um, the episode is uh, well known for being rejected entirely, like the script of the episode in being entirely rejected by ABC and their you know broadcast standards and practices. It wasn't until Ian Pearson called them, <laughs> he had to do a little bit of a... Uh, uh, maneuvering there, verbal maneuvering to get it through. But do you know anything about that or what was going on behind the scenes? No, I don't know anything about that stuff. I mean, like I get, once again, I was, you know, called in to record and I was pursuing my own things and they, they were producing a TV show, which was a first of its kind, which is, you know, everything was new and, uh, you know, they were pushing boundaries and, you know, it's a testament to the show that it is in the Smithsonian in the United States because it was the first computer animated yes. show. So I do know that there, what we would do, there were certain things that the U S couldn't show, which was, you know, for the BSNP, like you're saying, broadcast standards and practices. Um, and they would do things. I remember like you couldn't show breaking glass because children would maybe, you know, reproduce that. So then if you remember, right. I don't know Imitate which episode. Thing. Yeah. So then there, I think it was the episode about painted windows where, the glass broke, but then it kind of reformed. So they're like, well, see, it didn't really break. Like they were kind of like, you know, loopholes to the, <laughs> to the, to the censorship rules. Yes. The glass breaks, but then it reforms. It didn't right. actually break. You're right. a student of law. Right. It's Are exactly these what it is. They're like, well, it broke, but it reformed. So is it broken? Right. That's the legal question. And then you can't show <laughs> like bullets. That. So That's you funny. have a gun shooting bubbles. 
right? You're like, it's not bubbles. shooting bullets, it's shooting bubbles, right? Is it a gun? It's a squirt gun. It's a, it's a soap gun or whatever. So <laughs> it's a bubble gun. It's yeah. a big gun, but it shoots right. bubbles. And there you go. BFG, which is getting around the sensors, right? What does yes, BF, yes, what does yes. BFG stand for? A big, big fun gun. Guitar. A big, a big, a big, a big fun gun. Oh, I see. You know, my mistake. Okay. It was just my dirty mind that took me. Right, there. right. See, we can't edit your mind, but we can definitely <laughs> edit how we, we disseminate it to you. What was it like working on Deadpool? Yes. Deadpool was, uh, this is interesting. Uh, they had shot the movie already and they went back to do reshoots, which is when they go back to fix things or add scenes for clarification. And uh, the scene that I'm in was part of the reshoots. And I got the audition, and the movie at the time was called Wham. It was the, uh, <laughs> the, the secret name of the movie Wham. Because as you remember in the movie, they used George Michael's Careless Whisper in the movie Wham. Yeah. So um, I got the audition, and uh, the character was, is listed as a Serbian warlord. And uh, I taped it in L.A., and I sent it to Vancouver, and they said they want you. And I flew to Vancouver to do it. But at the same time, I was offered a part in Toronto on a show called Beauty and the Beast with Kristen Kruk. And that was a longer job. And I said, oh, I really want to do this movie. I have a feeling that it will do something. It will be big. And uh, it almost looked like I couldn't do it, but they worked it out. So I filmed that on a, you know, in the morning. And that evening I flew to Toronto and I started filming Beauty and the Beast the next day. You're, you're such a busy guy. You're doing so much stuff. Like, do you have a day that you're doing nothing, that you have time to relax? Many days I don't have anything to do. <laughs> I know when you look really? at the internet, it looks like I'm, I'm working all the time. But, you know, there's so many, so much downtime and you really have to self-motivate and uh, be proactive to keep at this. Do you have any favorite lines uh, portraying Bob? It's so hard to remember something that you've read once or twice years ago. <laughs> yes, sorry, but, we've already talked but, about no, this. No, I know, but what was great was learning what lines resonate with people or what people, you know, repeated. And Stay Frosty was one of them, which I didn't realize it would have such a line. And when I signed autographs or books at conventions, people want me to write Stay Frosty or, or something like that. So the one that's really funny is I don't think so. And yeah. I've talked about this. Do you want me to tell the story here? Because I've already told it, but it's, sure, it's yeah, so great. Right ahead. So in the original script, I think it was in the first or second episode, you know, something, something's going to happen. And Bob says, I don't think so. And I immediately th thought that it was a referral to uh, the LL Cool J song, Going Back to Cali, which had, was only a few years old at that point. And uh, I thought, oh, this is like a, you know, a wink and a nod to, you know, going back to Cali. To Cali, to Cali, going back to Cali. Uh, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So I did my Bob version of, uh, no, I don't think so. So that's why that kind of the read came from that. And then years later, I'm in LA and I'm at a function and LL Cool J is there. And mm -hmm. I go up to him and I start talking to him and I tell him the story and he kind of looks at me. And then he licks his lips as he does, and he goes, I like that. I like that. <laughs> so, uh, so it comes full circle, which is, I don't think so, came right back to him. Yeah. Speaking of uh, favorites, you know, the favorite question is kind of a tough one because you have to kind of pick one sure. memory out of like a gajillion. But um, I'm going to make this a little bit more broad. Um, working, with, um, working with the group, I mean, I think you guys, I don't know you were in L.A. a lot of the time, but when you were in Vancouver with everyone you know, talking with other voice actors and with the, the creators and hearing your interviews elsewhere. It sounds like you had a lot of fun working with everybody. And do you keep in touch with anyone from the show anymore? Yes, good question. So I, re-watching the um, Bad Bob episode, uh, that was the last episode that Phil Hayes played Hack. And uh, he and Gary Chalk... Um, I knew for years before doing cartoons and I was younger than them by several years and they were kind of big brothers to me in, in the Vancouver acting community. And I remember doing my first acting job ever was with Gary Chalk on Barbie and the Rockers where I voiced Ken. Of Ken, Ken did Ken. That's right. Yes. And that was my first job. I was about 17 and, and Gary was there and I've worked with Gary many times over the years on different shows on camera and voiceover. 
And Phil Hayes and I became good friends. We both moved to L.A. at the same time. And that was the last episode that he recorded as part of the duo. And most of that stuff was their interplay was kind of improvised between the two of them. You know, uh, Phil is a stand-up comedian as well as an actor, and uh, he's very, very uh, talented. And, uh, you know, Kathleen I knew through voice acting, and um, I'm trying to think who else. And Michael Donovan I had known since he started uh, cartoon acting because he was a DJ originally in Vancouver. And right. when I used to help a guy named Doug Parker, who was the casting director, I helped him cast some shows in the early 90s, and one of them was called Captain N, the Game Master. And Michael Donovan came in, and I remember kind of giving him a visual direction for a character that he ended up booking his first cartoon called The Eggplant Wizard, kind of flapping my arm <laughs> yes. together up and down as though that's the size of his lips. And uh, so he ended up, you know, getting jobs with me and, and then eventually directing. And then he also moved to uh, Los Angeles and uh, I would see him at, at auditions and such. But, uh, you know, these guys were a different age range than me. You know, Phil was a little closer to my age. But we were definitely good friends, and I'm still in contact with, uh, I see Gary when I'm in Vancouver, and, and Phil, and uh, I'm trying to think who else was in it. Um, you know, uh, Jesse Moss, who was the original Enzo, what, you know, they kept replacing them every time as their voice would change. But uh, yes. whenever I see Jesse, uh, you know, we, we have a good hug, and we, we catch up. And, um, and Andrea Thanks Romano, so who was the voice director for the first season, um, was instrumental in me being referred to my agent at the time uh, that got me into the United States. And uh, I always owe her a big debt of uh, gratitude and thanks because I wouldn't still be doing this if not for her referral and getting the role of Haji and Johnny Quest. Uh, you know, I don't know. You undersell yourself, I think. Oh, thank you. And she also directed me in a show called Sitting Ducks, uh, which was for Universal about the, uh, the you know, computer animated ducks. And I played a character named Raul there who was a crow. Which was also with Phil Hayes. Phil Hayes, though, like, I always kind of wondered, what, why was it that he left the show? I guess, you know, he went down to L.A. I think it was things? the difficulty of them, because their characters were interplaying, like they needed to do them kind of on together. So right. today things have changed with technology. You can voice patch and there's not as much of a lag or, you know, technical interference. Uh, at the time, they really wanted us to be in the room. And, uh, you know, and I was doing that. I was flying myself up to do the, you know, to do the stuff on my own dime. And, and uh, I think that, the, you know, the powers that be, they feel kind of very protective of their baby, which is a show. And then they'll kind of. So things kind of go in the industry. I've, I've heard you and other sure. voice actors say before. I was going to say. And then uh, Phil Hayes was replaced by Scott McNeil, who I've also known for many years, doing, you know, the, a version of that character. And uh, it just shows how interchangeable actors can be when when the powers that be want to do that i don't suppose everybody can but i i've always felt that myself at least i can kind of you know pick spot the difference you know if there's been some change like that oh, of or course, if i of course of course i mean that's you know, my job which is you know voiceover and sure. listening to voices and such but i mean you know they're still making you know bugs bunny cartoons you know and mel blank has been dead for 30 years so yeah, that's you know true. you have someone doing their best version of it and they're not going to stop you know, Warner Brothers is not going to stop doing that because it's it's a part of their industry. I mean, it's it propels the machine that is Warner Brothers, the licensing, the voicing, the cartoons, the video games, everything. You you've answered a lot of questions for me before I even had a chance to uh, to ask. Thanks okay. for you know looking ahead and and uh, watching the episode and everything. Before we go, is there anything you want to say in closing? Um, yeah, I, it's really. Um, touching that people still care about this show so many years after the fact and uh you know um you just never know in life uh as an actor what is going to resonate with people and uh that you're going to be known for so you know if if i never acted in a, again in my life uh i would be happy that uh reboot is something that i'm known for because it seems to have really you know been near and dear to a lot of uh, kids around the world who are now adults and especially Canadian kids, because it played so much there. And I'm proud in some way that it was, you know, produced and made in Canada, albeit by a bunch of uh, Brits and Americans. <laughs> but, uh, yes. I, mean, well, I mean, you know. Which is also a very Canadian thing. Right. But what, what, what is a, you know, what is a, what is a, a human being It made that, you know, we're all in this together. 
So, yes. I mean, uh, it was a good show. It was a positive show. It, it taught a lot of people about the computers, myself included. And uh, I don't know. I feel that um, my portrayal was something that was um, warm and, and uh, comforting to people, I think. So uh, I get that a lot when I meet people. They're like, he was my hero. She's, girls would say I had a crush on him, that kind of thing. And, uh, and it's nice to know that it, it, you know, it affected people, for sure. It certainly did. And it was a, it was a big part yes. of my childhood and the childhood of uh, you know, a lot of other people. Not just, I mean, in Canada, definitely, but all across the world. It speaks to your portrayal of Bob. And I think you hit it on the nose just now when you said the word warm. He's a really warm character he's the hero and you know he's not perfect and you know exactly because he's not perfect you know he's aspiring right. to do the right thing and right. in your portrayal of him you really hit that just right well you know i know we're supposed to wrap it up but you're making me kind of think about it and analyze it which is what makes a successful television show you know albeit you know animator or live action is it's a family Right, which is that they created, you know, through the writing and the, the design of the show, it was a, a, a family of sorts. You know, Bob and Dot were kind of the quote parents, and you know, Enzo and Frisket were the children, and you know, you're, you know, the, that's what I think appealed to ABC maybe in the beginning and YTV, which is you have this kind of pseudo father figure, big brother, uncle, you know, who is kind of youthful but still paternal in a way. And uh, I think that that's the success of a lot of shows and reboot as well, which is uh, kids like that. You know what I mean? I think kids like that. I know I liked it. You know, I'm, I'm remembering my own favorites as a child, and I loved Spider Man and things like that. Which is it? You you want to be Spider Man, but also he's your cool older brother. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So uh, I think that that is part of the the success and the enduring appeal of Reboot and Bob in particular was this kind of um, pseudo family. Well, let's wrap things up here. Thank you very much, Michael Benier. Thank you, Ken. Thank you again for listening, everyone. Be sure to check out our other commentaries and Q&As for episodes including Wizards, Warriors, and a word from our sponsor, Icons, The Edge of Beyond, and Web Riders on the Storm, where we talk about Reboot with cast and crew. See you again next time.